We're delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's talk, Body, Blood and Spirit, in collaboration with our exhibition, Statements, by Nimala Dutt. Our guest speaker is Edin Koo, director and founder of Pusaka, a center for the preservation and documentation of the traditional arts in Malaysia. Edin is also a writer, translator, and a poet. Today he will be speaking about the journey of Pusaka over the last 20 years, the search for memory through explorations of collective culture, and also how the aesthetics of traditional arts have influenced contemporary artists, looking in particular at the iconography of Wayang Kulit, of stupas and of energy points in the work of Nimala Dat. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Edin Koo. Good afternoon. Um, I'm waiting for my mother. <laughs> um, but thank you. Uh, we're late. I apologize. And uh, if there are two things I love in the world, it's rain and demonstrations. Uh, but that leads always to the thing I hate most in the world, which is traffic jams. It took me half an hour to make a U-turn uh, outside. Um, I'm very um, touched. Hi, Jill. <laughs> I'm very touched uh, and very privileged that uh, you, you um, weathered the jam to listen to this, our first uh, um, talk. Uh, to commemorate our 21st year of Pusaka's uh, founding. Um, and uh, I really wanted to start with my mother here because I wanted to, her to see that I'm wearing very polished shoes today. Uh, the last time I spoke, apparently my shoes were faded and she got very upset. Um, but it's a good place to start talking about Pusaka and talking about our ritual traditions, uh, which is really to explore this idea of vanity uh, and um, uh, within Southeast Asia's spiritual and ritual traditions, the idea of vanity has a very interesting place. Uh, it is something, of course, that we have to fight against, um, you know, for all reasons of arrogance and ego. It's also the one thing that is most elevated in performative traditions, uh, the idea of beauty, uh, the idea of uh, aesthetics, uh, and of course, the very operative word, which has um, many uh, different terms in various cultures, but this idea in Malay and Indonesian of what we call halus uh, or refinement as uh, the principal aesthetic idea for us to reach towards. Uh, so if you look at uh, Southeast Asian uh, representative uh, traditions, such as the Wayang Kulit, um, you will find uh, the notion of someone strong and beautiful uh, is someone quite short and slight with a very thin waist. Uh, and uh, ogres and monsters are often portrayed as rather tall people uh, and not to be aspired uh, to. Uh, that has, of course, also very contemporary uh, resonances. Uh, so if you look at the way Diego Maradona uh, plays with a ball, or the way that Bruce Lee brought down that great giant Karim Abdul-Jabbar, uh, this idea of basically the slight, the small, the refined, uh, the thin waist, uh, wasted is, um, is something very extolled. But I have been very drawn to that idea of the constant tension and contradiction between notions of humility, notions of lack of ego, notions of uh, very, um, uh, very, um, uh, modest uh, appearances uh, with this idea of very elevated and transcendental beauty. Um, I've got notes. Uh, to begin with, uh, I'd like to thank the Ilham Gallery very much. Uh, it is one of the great inspiring spaces of Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, my childhood friend is its director and has done a really marvelous job of bringing some very extraordinary things here uh, to commence uh, lasting conversation about what culture and cultural life means to our collective. Um, there's also a reason why I wanted this series of talks of Pusaka's experience over the past 21 years to be held here. Because this was the last space my father had his last public engagement. And um, 
we did a conversation that was really packed uh, as people came to see the great historian in his last days. And uh, I, I conducted the conversation. And um, the very moving and painful thing of that conversation was that he could remember nothing. Uh, it was a talk on the history of Kuala Lumpur. And um, he had um, just about forgotten everything he knew about Kuala Lumpur. And he was one of the foundational historians of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, but uh, the sheer presence of the great historian in his final days seemed to be able to overwhelm everybody. And though he couldn't speak and couldn't say very much, uh, his presence uh, seemed to be able to uh, pull through and win over uh, everyone. The power of charisma sometimes. All these esoteric things, a word that we have come to greatly, greatly uh, not recognize, not acknowledge anymore, this idea of the esoteric, uh, which is so elemental uh, in the psychological and spiritual life uh, of uh, people here in our region. But the one thing that also struck me and has preoccupied me intellectually since then is the idea of history as we understand it in today's terms, histories of nations, histories of people, contested histories, uh, and the idea of memory, which I actually have been working on for close to 30 years without really understanding the difference between history uh, as a narrative, often an official narrative, and the notion of memory, which is the most operational thing in ritual theater that we work in, whether it's in Kudakapang, or whether it's in Mak Yong, or whether it's in Main Putri, uh, whether it's in Wayang Kulit. And it just dawned on me at that time that uh, there are very different uh, experiences. And uh, while my father's sense of history really dissipated, uh, his sense of personal memory became very alive. Something that in all the years that I knew him, of course, he didn't pay much attention to uh, the history of his family or the history of his relationship with my mother. Uh, but as he began to not remember the name of the second prime minister of Malaysia, um, he started to remember very fond things about my mother. Uh, and it dawned on me, uh, no wonder that the great calling in healing, the, the theater of healing, of ritual, is the notion of memory uh, and the claim to your lineage and genealogy. What that comes across in terms of history as fact, a Dickensian view of history, facts, sir, facts, all I want are facts. Um, these things, I think, have really brought about a great tension and contradiction uh, within our collective lives as a nation as compared to our collective lives as a, as a, as a culture. Uh, and the notion of memory has very little to do with a series of events. The notion of memory has a lot to do with that concept of bod body, blood, and spirit that is to be found in the ritual theater that we, we uh, work in. Uh, we stand amidst this exhibition. Uh, again, one of the very inspired things that uh, Ilham has done. Uh, and one of, the, one, one of the very important aspects, I think, of uh, uh, what this gallery has been attempting to do, aspiring to do with Rahel at the helm, uh, is bring back this notion of collective memory. Nirmala Dat, um, or Auntie Nim, as we knew her, because she was my mother's uh, roommate at the YWCA, uh, in that other great experience of Malaysia, of the emigration, immigration of uh, small town children to Kuala Lumpur to begin their lives in an independent country. Uh, so my mom and uh, Auntie Nim shared a room in the YWCA just near uh, Pataling Street. Uh, Nirmala Dad, um, apart from her great social consciousness as an artist that she's been um, renowned for, come to be known as, uh, is really captures a moment, I think, in the late 60s and 1970s, very, very crucial time in Malaysia's uh, modern history and also in its cultural development uh, of basically uh, seeking to make sense, 
and seeking to employ and seeking to excavate uh, that great language of, of, uh, of um, mythology and symbolism. Uh, so many, so much of our modern, of, of the beginnings of our artistic tradition were borrowed, um, visual representations uh, that followed very much European styles of presenting. Uh, so even people like pioneer painters like Hossein Enas, whom you showed here uh, earlier, in, I think, in, Ilha, in Ilham, uh, were artists from that tradition. Uh, but by the 1960s and 1970s, uh, Nirmala was one of the uh, representatives of that. Mum, come just sit wherever. Come. Yeah, Auntie Susie. Sorry, it's intimate, so I just, you know, bring my mum, right? Yeah, so the late 1960s and 70s, when beyond representation, I think uh, many of our artists and our playwrights and our poets attempted to get under the blood of what was Southeast Asia, what was pulsating Southeast Asia. So if you look around some of the very, the more, I think, um, powerful and uh, provocative paintings, you will find lots of representations of stupas and uh, an attempt to explore the shadow play. Uh, this was not only uh, common to her, uh, but I think there was a point uh, in the mid-60s and 1970s uh, when just a visual representation of what Southeast Asia was was not enough. Uh, and this was a movement that began uh, just about everywhere. If you go to the Philippines, if you go to, to Indonesia, if you go to Thailand, and it happened in Malaysia, uh, I think most uh, prominently with uh, Latif Mohidin uh, and his Pago Pago series, uh, which drew so much on uh, classical Southeast Asian structures, the notion of the stupa. The stupa is also wear, worn on the head uh, of a wonderful ritual dance drama called the Manora in Klantan. Uh, and it's the power point between the heavens uh, and the earth. And whoever wears the stupa or whoever is associated with the stupa does have that connection. Um, in Indonesia, you had uh, dramatists like William Rendra, W.S. Rendra, uh, who was really a, a, a force of nature uh, an Indonesian Christian from um, Java, who went to, who studied, you know, um, as a as a, as a uh, altar boy, uh, he was brought into um, Western theatrical traditions while serving in the church, and then later went to Michigan to study Western theatre. Uh, came back and discovered that he really didn't have a vocabulary uh, to express the theatre of his times. And uh, so what he did was travel all of Indonesia uh, and study with uh, shamans and healers uh, to, to imbibe um, not just the spirit of Indonesian theatre in, its, in its, all its indigeneity, but also the methods. Uh, and from that, a lot of modern Indonesian theatre was, uh, was born, Putu Vijaya, people like that, exploring these um, uh, traditions. Uh, what is, that has a lot to do, really, with the background of um, how Pusaka was formed. Uh, this is the first of a series of talks, and I hope there will be, uh, and I think we will have another over the next few months, uh, to try and structure Pusaka's work and look at the various uh, areas that we have tried to explore. Uh, everything from the notion of spirit, the notion of temperament and wind, uh, the idea of song, the notion of healing, uh, right up to very pragmatic issues like the economy of traditional ritual performance and aspects of cultural politics. Uh, but this, my first talk, is really, really about me uh, and about this really wild uh, journey, I think, uh, that began about 30 years ago uh, and that involved um, five, really, of uh, the most prominent uh, and most um, animated and vibrant uh, traditional artists, all of whom are, have passed now, um, and they represented the last generation of what we could really call the old ritual traditions in terms of methodology, in terms of how they were taught, in the uh, context they, they, they came up from. Uh, and perhaps maybe my last talk will be a rather sad one about 
about what have been the successes and not so successes of, 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 of Pusaka. But um, uh, I started this work 30 years ago uh, when I joined the press as a journalist. Uh, I was at first did the beat uh, of a cub reporter uh, covering parliament and very silly things, but uh, some also quite tragic things like Highland Towers, you know, and how fast everything goes from our memory. Yeah? Who remembers these days? Um, but soon after, uh, I was given a beat, and I think I was the first full-time cultural journalist in the Malaysian press. This was 1992, and uh, Malaysia was very confident at that time because we were rich, and Dr. Mahathir had uh, you know, introduced his Wawasan Vision 2020, by which time we would be a developed nation. And uh, one of the criteria, or one of the characteristics of that developed nation would be, would be that we would have a cultivated cultural industry. Uh, none of that cultivated cultural industry referred to any of the traditions. It referred to having Western orchestras and big galleries, uh, but nothing was said about things like Wayang Kulit or Mark Yong and its place in our, in our lives. Um, but it did give me uh, lots of favours. So uh, two weeks after I was um, given that beat of being the first full-time cultural journalist, uh, my boss, a uh, rather interesting uh, um, kind of bohemian uh, editor, came up to me one day as I was typing a story and said, Edin, uh, you go to Singapore? Lah, huh? So I said, oh, very nice to interview you, David Bowie. And so there I was, six months later, interviewing David Bowie, perhaps the prettiest man I've ever seen. Um, and uh, there are so many other stories uh, of that, of uh, you know, chasing stories to interview Ravi Shankar, uh, interviewing Ray Charles and B.B. King within a space of a week in Kuala Lumpur. Well, that was Kuala Lumpur then. Today we have trouble getting permits for, for concert. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, apart from uh, some really fine uh, theatre that was coming up in Kuala Lumpur, very often involving Joe, um, and there was Christian Jit at that time, and Christian Jit, I think I interviewed about, reviewed 20 of his plays, and I think I only gave him two good reviews. Uh, but such was the spirit of the day that, you know, he didn't run to social media and crap on me uh, for that, but in fact acknowledged and we were in big. So it was a very, very fertile. But I must say there was uh, so much mediocrity. And uh, being the cultural journalist based in Kuala Lumpur, I got very bored very fast. Uh, I remember v reviewing a play that was held in the old actor studio, which was under the um, Slango Club, uh, called in British days The Spotted Dog. Uh, and the play was so bad that I reviewed actor studios' toilets and seats and ra ran a whole history of The Spotted Dog on top there and uh, gave two lines about how wretched the play was. Uh, again, back in those days, you didn't have them running to social media and crapping on me. Uh, but that was basically the scenario. And uh, then the party who has, uh, who organized this demonstration today, uh, Party Islam, uh, did me a great favor. Uh, and they basically proscribed as part of their attempt to, and I say this apolitically, um, on the one hand, it also drew me to a lot of very interesting political stories and a lot of very good friends in Party Islam, uh, which allowed me then to do my very subversive cultural work without them ever disturbing me, not until today. Um, I think we should do a talk about strategies, Pusaka strategies against uh, 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 Islamic movements. Um, but uh, yeah, as I said, um, they did me a great favor by proscribing in their efforts to Islamize Klantani's society. And I think the word that was, the phrase that was used uh, by the then chief minister uh, and now regarded as some kind of saintly figure in Party Islam, whose name was Nick Abdul Aziz Nikmat, chief minister of Klantan and a very dear friend of mine. Uh, but uh, his uh, view was that they were going to Islamize and transform the Malay Muslim mindset. Uh, and that include very pedestrian things like the banning of alcohol, sale of alcohol, the banning of gambling uh, centers, and if you knew what Kota Baru was like in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was known as the, uh, as the brothel capital of 
the Northeast, uh, also known as the Paris of the East, uh, where murders and uh, you know alcoholic <laughs> feuds were, were very common. Um, but all that aside, uh, the very fa fascinating thing was that he decided to ban all forms of traditional or ritual performance for purposes of not having ritual in performance, not having women in performance, not having uh, puppets uh, be representative uh, of uh, particular kinds of uh, um, characters. Uh, and uh, um, I think the thing that struck me most was the, the, the thing about women, because women had played such a prominent role uh, in Klan, not only in Klantani's life, but the origin stories of the Klantani's are all located with women. Uh, and it was also very interesting to me uh, to find how, when I first went to Klantan, uh, that old myth, the old cliché of never marry a Klantani's woman uh, was still uh, very operative in the sense that women still dominated the economy, they dominated cultural life, they dominated the marketplaces, and still. Uh, in my reading, I came across interesting accounts, one account by the father of modern Malay literature, whose name was Abdullah Kader Munshi, otherwise known as Munshi Abdullah. Very interesting, and uh, um, very interesting fact that the father of modern Malay literature uh, was a Tamil-speaking Indian Muslim and the teacher of Malay to Raffles. But uh, Munshi Abdullah made a, a, a trip to Kelantan. And in those days, uh, going to Kelantan was going to a whole other world. Uh, before James Fraser came and broke the back of the spine of Malaya and put a loop, you couldn't even cross it by road. You had to take a, a boat. And Munshi talks about how he makes this trip to Kelantan. And he arrives at the Kelantan River and they are moored there for about three weeks because there's a feud in Klantan, civil war in Klantan, and it's, a, it's in a war state. Um, and all his stereotypes, all his beliefs that Klantan was a wild, tameless place uh, were true while he was on the, on, the, on, 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 the, on the boat, on the ship. But eventually everything calmed down and he ventured in to the jetty. And he talks about how it defied all his expectations because, in fact, it was a very highly cultivated and very cosmopolitan society where most of the shops along the riverfront were run by native Chinese. He calls them China Asli, native Chinese who had been there for centuries, spoke Klantanese like Klantanese Malays. And as he made his way inward across the jetty, he found a society that was economically very thriving, very vibrant, except that the entire economy was driven and administered by women. This is what he said of the men. They are lazy, useless, engage in cockfighting all day and drunkenness. Um, if you look at the politics of Klantan, you will see that that has not much changed. <laughs> um, but that's how it all began for me. Um, and this is, I think, um, one of the pictures I love best. It's a rather badly taken picture, but that, that is my uh, adopted father, uh, my Klantanese father, uh, whose name is Abdullah Ibrahim. Um, and he was known as Abdullah Bajumera, Abdullah of the Red Shirt, uh, also known as Dalang Samsing, or the Hooligan Dalang, uh, because his plays were constantly lampooning uh, people of power. Right? Uh, and um, he was greatly regarded and greatly venerated in Klantanese society uh, and really fit into all those stories you hear about traditional ritual performers having special powers or being allowed, given allowances uh, that no other member of society, including community and political leaders, were allowed. Yeah? Uh, and uh, Padola was a, a very funny and uh, subversive man. Uh, Joe knew him, of course, Pauline knew him, and, and uh, he had very large ears and he was very tiny. Uh, but his observations were always kind of razor sharp. Uh, and he had a lot of gall 
And uh, it was Padola who taught me to fight the fight of Pusaka. How you do it, by being naughty and subversive and irreverent, uh, but being always very smart and intelligent. Uh, this is the kind of, of audacity this tiny man who lived in a small kampung house in Kotlanas, Klantan, kind of audacity he had, uh, only because the society regarded him with that amount of reverence. In 2004, uh, after a great deal of, you know, Posaka's attempting to bring out the issue of Kelantan, not in terms of rights, but really what culture means and what these traditions mean to the people of Malaysia, uh, the Kelantan state government decided that they would have a negotiation about the lifting of the ban on Wayang Kule. Uh, and uh, part of that negotiation was to come to a compromise uh, about how the performances uh, would be shaped and structured according to government dictates. Censorship, lah, censored, uh, wayang kulit, basically. Uh, and they kept get, trying to get Pak Dola, who was, of course, the best known uh, dalang in Kelantan. Uh, they tried to get him for a series of meetings. And uh, no less than the chief minister's office called him at about three or four times. And, finally, and he refused to you know, give a date about when the meetings would happen. Uh, and finally, they gave him a date. And he said, uh, OK, I will see. I will look at it. And you know, I'll check it out and see if it works. Uh, and finally, he never got back. So they called him the day before. And they asked him, you know, um, will you attend the meeting? Please attend the meeting. And he said, no, I can't come. And they said, oh, is everything all right? Are you well? Is your family OK? He said, yes, everybody's very, very fine. He's, and they asked him, why can't you come? And his answer to the um, chief minister's office was, I can't decide if I'm going to come by motor car or motorcycle. So I've decided just not to come. Yeah. Uh, and so that meeting was cancelled. Uh, to attempts uh, to engage him on more theological aspects of how Wayang Kulit goes against fundamental tenets of Islam and so on. Uh, and this has with official religious authorities. He just had one thing to say to them, and it's actually been recorded in an interview I did. Uh, and they would elaborate on all the various heresies uh, that take place when a Wayang Kulit performance is, uh, is conducted. And remember, the word heresy is, is, has particular resonance within a theological dialogue. His response was standard, and it was one line. My Quran is the same as yours. I am as Muslim as you are. And that's it. Um, and he was a man with nothing, with uh, no influence, no political influence, uh, and lived and died in, in a great deal of, of poverty. But uh, he treasured nothing more than cultural dignity and the dignity of his lineage and uh, genealogy. And so he never, never compromised on that. Uh, it was very important to me because it helped shape at a time when this language of preservation, heritage, UNESCO um, began to be very, very uh, uh, prominent and come into cultural life a lot. Uh, it was the kind of language that he abhorred uh, because it was reductivist uh, and it made victims of cultural people. Uh, and up till today, we have shaped our language without using any of that um, uh, kind of terminology or attitude. Uh, because it was very important for people who are challenged uh, to not yield, especially for purposes of subsistence, grants, funding, uh, to the language that innovates uh, both their traditions and themselves. Uh, this is a uh, a man called Echom Echuan. He was a leading master of a tradition called the Manora. And the Manora is a very interesting mix uh, of uh, Thai, Klantanese, Buddhist ritual, serious ritual associated with religion, and Malay Muslim forms of storytelling. Uh, and they converged in this tradition. Though 
Each person professing different faiths understood their space. And there were spaces in which the Malay Muslims would participate. And there would be spaces where they would not. Uh, but what always I found so illuminating is what that, that, that idea of space was conducted through consensus and self-knowledge. And there was no forcing of one or another uh, into those uh, spaces. And of course, what happens when you begin to proscribe and permit is that you create false lines according within a society that has already decided for centuries what its spaces are. Uh, Pai Echom was an absolutely sublime dancer, uh, and he too came with all kinds of mythology surrounding him that was not just about his genealogy. Yeah? Uh, I, I love Joe's phrase when she first saw him dance. She wrote to me and she said, when you see him dance, you could faint. <laughs> and he had that kind of, of power. Uh, that power was sometimes played out in very, very interesting ways. The kind of authority that a lead dancer has over his troops, what he chooses to pay them, how they revere him. I remember once we brought them to Kuala Lumpur and for some reason, all the hotels were booked. And so I had no choice but to put them in the YMCA in Brickfields. Except the YMCA had a shared bathroom. So Pai Echum would have to have a bath, uh, have a shower, have a bath in the common bathroom. And so I checked them all in and then he went up to his room and all of a sudden there was this huge uproar. He was shouting and in Thai, uh, you know, and everybody was trying to placate him. And I was a bit unnerved and I asked pa Harun, his main drummer, what's the, what's the, what's the matter? And uh, he said, oh, pa Ichim is very upset about the bathroom. He can't bathe in a common bathroom. And I said, oh, I see, I'm sorry, um, why? And uh, he said, well, because when he baits, he becomes a wild boar. Uh, now, who knows the veracity of that, but that's obviously <laughs> the way that you, uh, you, you, you have a hold. Um, and towards the end, or maybe in a whole lecture, I, I would like to talk about this idea of myth uh, and how that operates within particular kinds of contexts. Uh, but when I first went to Kelantan, entered the state of ritual, um, this is what I heard. Can we just have Meti singing? I had it myself, I had it rain. I had it rain. Kalau abang keluar Balak di lame Oh balak adik we um, The Mak Yong is encapsulates the Kelantan Malay spirit uh, which I think is very reflective, that's Matsuti, uh, very reflective, I think, of the Malay disposition as a whole, uh, the ritual and traditional Malay disposition, which is very much rooted in a sense of loss and pathos. Um, as a trained musician, I'm a trained musician, uh, I found entering this world of musicianship where things were so incredibly improvised. Yeah. Uh, and so that the rabab, which is the main instrument that accompanies the mak yong, uh, is organized according to the pitch of the respective singer. So it's not the singer who adjusts their pitch to the main principal instrument. Uh, it's the instrument that adjusts itself to the pitch of the singer. It's, I was also amazed at, at the, the quality of microtones in which it works. Uh, and as we, some of us ethnomusicology friends of mine tried to annotate some of the singing, they found they couldn't actually arrive at particular Western notes uh, to capture this singing because it, you know, the frills and what you call the bunga was all over the place. 
Uh, there was also the quality of wailing, of as if you were crying, which then later, much later, as I explored more and more uh, um, uh, traditional or ritual forms of singing, ranging everything from uh, North American uh, Indian communities, and, you know, the Ojibwa and people like that, and the Irish, uh, I, I, I came to discover that there was this incredible cross um, similarities uh, of the notion of the voice, the breaking of the voice, the wailing, uh, and this idea of releasing grief. Uh, and the Mark Yong is all about grief, all about loss, all about the sense that we are all lost in this world and finding our way. Um, and then when you enter the world of symbolism of the Mark Yong, uh, you will find that the main instrument, the rabab, which is a spiked fiddle, and there are varieties of rabab all over the place, the kamanche in Iran and uh, the sarangi in India, uh, which have a lot more of an evolved musical tradition. But I found the philosophical and psychological traditions associated with the rabab and Mark Yong in Klantan, extremely, extremely lyrical, powerful, deep, and also quite heartbreaking. Uh, so that the rabab uh, is constructed in the form of a human being. And it has a pointless teat on the side with a string. Uh, and it's believed to be able to basically, uh, um, uh, through a process of suckling, I think, you suckle the spirit. Uh, bring back a person to a state of restitution. Uh, it also reminds us, it reminds uh, performers and communities uh, of the origins of their faith, uh, Islam, because the rabab is believed to have been made from the spine of Adam, the first man. Uh, and so the salutation to the rabab is really a return uh, uh, to your point of origins. Uh, genealogy and memory. I talked about my father and I talked about my father at Ilham. Were you here already? Not yet. Okay. I'll repeat that later for you. Um, but this notion somehow that memory has a hold uh, on us through ancestry, through Moyang, uh, through our lineage, uh, that it does not have in a sense of official history. Uh, so history made very intimate like in, like in my father's last days, when he couldn't remember the prime minister's names, but could remember how he dated my mother, which he never spoke about ever in his entire life, uh, and how history becomes that intimate. It's played out in the Mark Yong all the time. How stupid of me never to, to, to come to realize that these two, two experiences were very separate things, and that I had used the word history all the time to talk about collective memory. Um, yeah, just roll the slides. Um, Klantan was a revelation uh, to me. It has always been um, a revelation, a source of mystery and enigma to even all other Malaysians. In fact, I think people have, uh, I could actually use the word term alienation, a kind of alienation towards the Klantanese Northeast that they don't even have with Borneo. Uh, most Malaysians have a very romantic notion of Borneo, but they have a very enigmatic and alienated response to Kelantan, yeah. um, and full of stereotypes, that it's filled with Talibanis, uh, that it is a completely <coughs> fundamentalist uh, state, uh, that women are oppressed. Uh, and I think Pauline had uh, a very irritating encounter recently with the wife of a diplomat uh, who said, um, oh, I'm so sorry that you work in Klantan. I, we feel such pity for you. Have you had such, you must have had terrible experiences. Uh, and uh, Pauline asked her, um, oh, have you been? And she said, no, no, but I heard a stand-up comedian tell us about how oppressive things were in Klantan. <laughs> now, uh, I'm, I'm very protective of Klantan, but if there's one person who's ready to tear the hair of anybody else who puts down Klantan, it's Pauline. Um, uh, when I first ventured up now that I think 30 years ago, it was quite mad, very reckless. And we had none of the roads that we had now in, in Klantan. 
uh, and my mother used to get very worried because I used to make day trips <laughs> to Kelantan, which was leave at 4 in the morning, arrive at 12, have a few conversations, do a few things, and then drive back at about 10 p.m. at night to be back here at 6 a.m. Uh, and then go back to work. Um, uh, but uh, entering that, uh, I try always to drive to Kelantan because the landscape, through the understanding of the landscape, you start to understand the operational dynamics of performance. When you drive into Kelantan, you drive into thick jungle. And I came to understand why a jungle is a jungle and a forest is a forest. They are very, very different things in terms of growth and symmetry. Um, a lot of my drives back in those days uh, was through very unruly territory. Uh, roads were not really carved up. Uh, and even within Klantan, uh, you didn't have many of the trunk roads now. So just in the space of 30 years, uh, the amount of development uh, uh, that has come in, uh, we had to cross a wooden bridge in Kuala Krai, one of those uh, really tenuous wooden bridges where cars would have to be parked and wait for oncoming traffic to go before, right, Datin Su remembers. Um, and um, yeah, and, and, and the idea of the tropics and the notion that in the tropics uh, throw a seed and anything will grow and that anywhere you stand, at least there are about 30,000 forms of life surrounding you. Uh, these things come very alive and then to see them kind of translate uh, into very deep philosophical uh, um, understanding of the nature of being, the notion of the self, things like angin or temperament, uh, desire, uh, nafsu, lust. Uh, I was also very uh, amazed that, you know, in this territory that was supposed to be Talibani and, uh, you know, puritanical and conservative, I discovered some of the deepest understandings of all those things I just spoke about. Desire, lust, and how they all had a place in our being. And if they were not allowed to express themselves, you would suffocate. You would suffer from delirium, you would suffer from depression, uh, you would suffer from all those things that basically suffocated um, the expression. I also began to discover that ritual theatre was so much about the idea of individuality and its interaction with community. Um, one of the other things I discovered very much was how open, free, and deeply understood was the idea of sexuality and gender. Uh, women who participate in Makyong rituals called Sama Angin, or you know, restituting your inner desires. Uh, women who play a very important family role, uh, a, a role as a wife, who then find a space in the Mark Yong Theatre essentially to literally let their head down, get on their falls, and uh, basically express a lot of this pent up. Also a space where their husbands are called in so that they can get beaten by their wives. Um, it, it really is uh, quite, I, I don't think we have uh, uh, videos here, but we have them in our... our um, and uh, very interesting ideas of the notion of healing. In the early 2000s, we worked with a group of Tok Putri, uh, masters of Mind Putri. Mind Putri is a serious healing uh, ritual. Uh, and um, we were asked to heal a particular patient. Uh, and we did, I think, healings for about a year, a year and a half. She was, she was quite prominent. This is not the lady, but um, this is the tradition. Uh, on our, and this is in Bacho, and Bacho is really quite a traditional place. Uh, Member of Parliament is a past representative. And uh, we conducted this ritual with two Toputris, healing this woman who was depressed. And the reason she was depressed was that she was childless. She was barren. And the um, uh, performance started, and 45 minutes through, uh, I reached over to Pauline and I said, she has a very interesting look, very angular, very angular features. And the uh, performance went on, and then the break came. Performances are about five hours, yeah, of the Mind Putri. 
and the break came and we had tea and everything and you know she attended to everybody like the women uh, and later we discovered that she was a trans person who had been married to this man in this village and had been married for close to 20 years and the source of her depression is the fact that she can't have children but what I found most extraordinary was the fact that the entire community um, gravitated and participated in this healing and they acknowledged her in the way that she wished to be acknowledged <laughs> and represented without there being any politics or polemics or religion about the fact that this was the way it was. Hmm? Uh, and I've always found that paradoxical that at a more national and educated and middle class level, we seem to have all these issues about a third gender. Uh, especially in a region where for at least 2,000 years, uh, until very, very recently in modern history, uh, we regarded third gender people uh, with a great sense of elevation. In Malay society at least, they were the representatives or communicators between the heavens and the earth. Uh, and they were complete people. Hmm? Complete, complete gender, complete genders. Um, so these things were, were, were very, very subversive. Uh, especially when you are discovering the country for yourself, a country you think you had, you had known. Um, we will talk about Angin and Semangat in, in, deeper, in deeper ways, but the other thing I, I came to discover in Malaysia, uh, in Kelantan in particular, was the nature of orality uh, and why our nation building really has been so disruptive and disruptive. Uh, and going back again to my father, uh, I refer to my father because he was the country's national historian. Uh, and so much of the national narrative was, foundational narrative in post-colonial Malaysia was laid by him. Not perverted by him later, but laid by him, perverted by other people. But in the discourse of history, uh, that there were many aspects in our rush to create a foundation, foundational national history um, that we seem to either ignore, uh, regard as marginal, not have time for or sideline. Uh, one is we haven't reconciled ourselves with the nature of orality. Uh, so a lot of the history of our community memories and collective memories uh, are still oral not written. And orality brings with it a whole different experience because it's a history of the entire senses. And of course, it has a very artistic bent. It's a quarrel that I think all Asian societies have when establishing foundational histories. Uh, how do we deal with the genealogies of Angkor and the Jayavarman kings? Obviously, we don't believe that Jayavarman II lived for 328 years, right? But the history of civilizational history of, of um, morality, of collectives, of a collective nature, not always free and liberal, yeah? They had very authoritarian impulses, these ideas. But how do we reconcile them with more empirical forms of history? Surely they cannot just be sidelined. The tension in Malaysia has become so serious that these days the impulse of myth or the desire to create myth through orality has been confused with more factual attempts at history. So today our history really is an exercise in fantasy. And basically we want to believe the history we want to believe. And then we drop in a few scientific terms like DNA and whatever not to attempt to afford credibility to our very confused approach to history. And I think the real wound is the fact that we don't know how to appreciate traditions like this. This is Pak Romli, uh, one of the great storytellers from Perlis. The storytelling uh, of uh, Awang Batil is also all about genealogies, human characteristics, about how community was forged, He's a single performer who plays with a pot, basically, and tells these stories in wonderful Perlis dialect. Um, 
but he has no place in our formal histories. And so he's regarded very strangely even by people within his community these days as a bit of an eccentricity uh, who has little less to say than uh, carry this pot and go around singing the history of, this, of, 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 his, of, of his people and, and the collectives. Uh, the other great um, form of orality and history making is the Wayang Kulit. Maybe we can just have a, a, a short sequence of that. <laughs> The uh, Wayang Kulit of, of Kelantan uh, has as its main story or what he, they call the trunk story. Um, the trunk story relates to the basically general storyline that is created, uh, upon which Dalangs then create branch stories. They lift off stories. Uh, so there's no such thing as the real Wayang Kulit, yeah? uh, which is something our cultural policy attempts to propagate you know, representations of the real Wayang Kulit. Since the 70s, this has been the habit. And in the contestation of that, finding the real Wayang Kulit, a person like Pat Dola, uh, who has always remained for 50 over years the most popular and the most respected Dalang in Kelantan, is pushed aside and somebody else replaces him in Kuala Lumpur as our, the national representative of our Wayang Kulit. And what the national representative actually does is basically implement uh, you know, the uh, performance ethos that are set up by ministries and bureaucrats, basically, and spearheaded by academics. Yeah? So it's not from the wellspring or the, of, or the ground of, 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 of people. Um, now, the, uh, Klantan Wayan Kulit uh, is derived from the Indian Ramayan, Ramayana. Uh, and uh, it is something I, I, I'm going to write on and, and explore, but uh, there were two forms in which the great Indian epics traveled to Southeast Asia. One was by the sea, and that was mainly the Mahabharat that landed in the islands of Java, and till today influences not just the Wayang Kulit of Java, but has influenced its entire culture. So if you go to Indonesia, uh, you will find that Dalangs have a very unique position in society, but not as rebels uh, like the Klantanese Dalangs. Right? Uh, they are propagators of classicism, of an invented Javanese tradition, if, 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 if I can put it that way. They're very highly associated with politicians. Uh, so in 2000, Five, I went to Solo and I met with President Soharto's Dalang. And uh, with my experience of working with Pak Dola in you know, these kinds of improvised spaces, um, in small pondo uh, theatres, uh, here was a Javanese Dalang you know, who lived in a great estate uh, and he wore rings on every finger. Yeah? And he was Pahartos or um, uh, Golkas Dalang. And every Wednesday, he'd open the gates of his estate to do free performances for the people in his constituency. Uh, the Javanese, of course, have a very elevated sense of themselves uh, and look at everything else as being you know, kind of marginal and shitty. Uh, and that's the way he spoke to me about Klantan uh, Wayang Kulet as being such an inferior tradition. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I, I was very uh, touched that the person who came to my defense was the great Indonesian writer Gonawan Muhammad, you know, uh, who 
countered his statements and then reached over to me and say, you know, Kelantan may have marginal Wayang traditions, but they don't have political lackeys like this guy. Um, and uh, Masgon then did me the greatest justice. Uh, when the performance started, 10 minutes into it, I saw him falling asleep right on the corner. <laughs> Javanese Wayangs go on forever. And, you know, and the point of classicism is the classicism. Whereas the point of the Kelantanese sense of the rebellious is how innovative and improvisatory you could be with your stories. And, right? and uh, uh, I will go into, in other lectures, go into whole things about how psychologies are associated with particular kinds of puppets, and then you become, you know, Anak Rama, Anak Maharajawana, or Anak Pak Dogol, and then your Wayang character is shaped around that. This doesn't happen anymore, at all. Um, and how there is a difference between your outer knowledge, your knowledge of technique and methodology and how you learn about Wayang Kulit, and your Ilmu Dalam, or your inner knowledge, your understanding of the more esoteric elements of uh, the, the Wayang Kulit, uh, and how the Wayang Kulit is really a real subversion of so much of our reality. And I remember the first question I asked Pak Dola, this unlettered man representing the oral tradition, is this. I said, why shadows? Okay, it's just very big, why shadows? And he gave me a really very profound and provocative answer. And he said, because uh, you know, the world is never as it seems. Mm? Uh, and uh, there is some force always manipulating something. And that's the Dalang. And uh, the Dalang basically is the great operator of this trick. Because the puppet or the image that is furthest from the audience is closest to the Dalang. And the image that is furthest from the Dalang is closest to the audience. And that is how the world plays its spin on you. And uh, the point of the Wayang is not to fight this inversion, but really to take part in it. And then he refers, of course, to um, one of the great ritual performances of the Wayang Kulit, which is very, very rarely done called the Feeding of the Spirits, or Burjamu. And he says, this is the culmination of where the Wayang reveals itself. Yeah? And the reason for that is this. After a three-night performance, in which the uh, inner winds, or the samangat, or the spirit of the Dalang is aroused and aroused and aroused, you perform for three nights, for about five hours each night, so that the performance becomes one entire cycle. At the last day of the performance, at the last day of the third night, you do a major ritual called the feeding of the spirits. And uh, it's really symbolically so potent and powerful because what happens, the feeding of the spirits, is this. A shaman comes on to the stage and at a particular ceremonial moment, takes a knife and cuts in half the kalir or the screen. Uh, and when that moment is done, there is no longer a division between the world of the, of the shadow and the play and the real world. And it is that moment when the Dalang began, takes on literally the spirits of the puppets, whereby he no longer plays the puppets anymore, but he feeds the puppet with eggs, raw eggs, and upon, you know, wipe, kind of uh, smearing the egg across the puppet, he imbibes the spirit of that puppet and it's beautiful because he gets up and he does the puppet's dance and movement. Done very rarely, um, uh, at the most three times in the life of a puppeteer. But it's quite amazing to look at the discipline and the patience of an entire Wayang life dedicated to this final realization that the Wayang and the real world actually are not, are not separate. Um, but uh, the Ramayan in Klantan is very interesting. And I've participated in so many conferences in India and in Thailand and in Cambodia, um, where other Ramayanic cultures are so scandalized by what Klantan has done to the 
Ramayan. And what has Kelantan done? First of all, it has got rid of the name Ramayan. Because when you go to speak to Kelantanese Dalangs, they all, of course, acknowledge that Rama is one of the protagonists of him, but none of them like him. They consider him vainglorious. They consider him egotistical. They consider him passionless uh, and uh, puffed up with a sense of his own self. So, in the <laughs> and his nemesis, Ravana, who is known, for example, in India as an evil king, uh, you know, in Thailand too, Rama is seen as an ogre. And uh, in uh, Klantan, he is all those things, but he is deeply loved. And he's deeply loved for his humanness and his frailties. Uh, but he's also deeply loved because he has great artistic powers and is known to be a great singer, he's known to be a great poet, and known for all his ugliness to be the great seductor. And uh, in the Dola Abdullah Ibrahim version of the Ramayan, or this, they don't even call it the Ramayan, they call it the story of Ravana. So in Klantan, it's not known as the story of Rama, it is known as the story of Ravana. And uh, in Padola's version, in Abdullah's version, so he's, as you can see, why he's a hooligan and a subversive. Um, uh, Rama and his great monkey an army, Hanuman, Hanuman, monkey army, they cross into Ravana's territory and they are defeated by Ravana and his ogres and his monsters. And Sita Devi is nicely captured, made captive. Um, but Ravana, has appears in the Klantanese version to have a purer love and desire for Sita, Sita Devi, than Rama even. Um, and so there is this moment in the, at the culmination uh, when uh, he seduces Sita, Sita Devi, who is torn, of course, by her loyalty to Rama, her husband, and to the sheer poverty and beauty of this very ugly king. Uh, who nevertheless is able to bring her closer and closer and you know, she, she falls prey to his seductions uh, until they almost fall into an embrace when she realizes and recognizes her loyalty to the king. And so as this Ravan character reaches to embrace her, she takes her hairpin and she stabs him in the back. And that's how Ravana is, dies in the, one of the Klantan versions. Now, when I said, when I, when I narrated this in India, it caused a, <laughs> it, it really caused a, a furor. And, you know, in India, they're amazing because they're a big country. They're huge with their traditions. And they're very Dickensian. So when they want to beat you down, they come with genealogies of Hanuman and whatever not, you know, and then just whack you with it, with these big narratives, when you are on that poetic line all the time, right? But yes, and I asked myself, you know, what has actually happened? Uh, and uh, this is my answer to a lot of the Islamic charge, or not even the Islamic, the, yeah, the, the political Islamic charge on the Ramayan. Malays are Muslims. Yeah, uh, when they do these performances, they do them as Muslims. Uh, so what they have actually done with the Ramayan is they have secularized it. They have made the Rama story, which has always been secular anyway, until the BJP came, turned up. Uh, but you know there is the element of the deification of Rama. So what has happened over the centuries is that there's been a great secularization of the Rama story to make it a very human one, uh, not having this kind of you know, aspect of the reverential that perhaps reaches towards deification. Um, it's also more and more representative, I think, of the, of the Klantan spirit. Uh, this, uh, this thing of approaches, everything relates somehow to sensuality, uh, to the struggle between uh, desire and the proper thing to, thing to do. 
uh, of uh, journeying of, of stories and always of loss and origin sources. Wayang, Mak Yong, beautiful to watch, absolute experience when you go there. But I've always found that uh, some of the best experiences and conversations take place either before the performance or after the performance. Uh, when performers gather around and argue and fight about you know, whose father was who and who married who. Um, in the Mak Yong, it was very instructive because uh, the Mak Yong operates on instinct. Yeah? So stories are not planned weeks before. Even ritual, big rituals that are being done. It's performed in the afternoon before the play is going to happen. And these things like take five hours. So you, the play must be part of your entire being, right? For you to be able to not only perform it, uh, and uh, uh, theatrically, operationally, it's very interesting because uh, Mak Yong, Wayang Kulit, they follow very strict structures until a certain point. Then it's all improvised. And then you return to the structure again. But what I've always found very interesting is um, as the community and, the, and, and uh, are discussing the performance, the main conversation, the main circle uh, are dominated by women. People like Mekti and her, and you know, some of them have got wonderful names. Siti, Ma Siti Titisan Ayemata. You know, City of the Great Tears. Okay? I, I had the great privilege to actually spend time with them, sit with them. And, and um, uh, they would sit down and work out the psychological territories of the day between themselves and then finally decide on the story which then correlates to what the patient is suffering from what kind of depression and it goes into you know great detail uh, all these structures of spiritual ailments and emotional ailments and uh, the men sit the men who are just the musicians basically <laughs> they sit outside this outside the main circle never take part in the conversation and literally just nod their heads to everything that the women say. Uh, very, very powerful. Um, not so much like that anymore. Not so much like that uh, anymore. Um, so this has been Pusaka's genesis. A uh, lot to do with politics, of course. A um, lot to do with uh, the cultural... Uh, unraveling of Malaysia over the past 30, 40 years in particular. A lot to do with what we think of um, tradition, what we think of modernity. Uh, and Nirmala and people like that are very important because this is the search, the search beyond the representative into this kind of, of terrain, uh, which somehow went lost along the way from the 80s and 90s. I, I, I didn't see that much engagement uh, anymore for all kinds of cultural reasons. and then. We could have a, another conversation on that. Um, but this 21 years, I've been thinking about how much needs to be recollected. Just in the span of these 30 years, they have been really quite cataclysmic, actually, <laughs> uh, without us ever realizing it. The power of distraction is, is um, so great these days. Uh, and I think one of the most enduring legacies of traditions of this kind, ritual traditions. Uh, I, I don't even like to use the term traditional theatre. It's useful for certain categorical reasons. But I've come to realise that also um, in our vocabulary today, we are even afraid to use the word ritual. Another of my great discoveries uh, in working with uh, communities of this kind uh, is the place and the play of language uh, and how the Malay language in particular uh, has been so compromised over a great many years through formalization, to national policies, to a bureaucratization and an officializing of the Malay language. And uh, to end, I will just locate myself in one of those terms. What is the Malay term for ritual? Adat. 
Adat is not. Adat is custom. Sorry? Upachara, yes. But Upachara relates more to the practice of that ritual. Okay? Samba, exactly. The word for ritual is Samba or Puja. But anyone who has any kind of deep understanding of the Malay language, which is a language of illusion, which is why the Pantone can only be born in a Malay language, because you can say seven contradictory things using one word. So the word for puja, for ritual, is puja. So puja pantai. But puja also means worship. Yeah. But in this context, it is not worship. It is ritual. And ritual relating to remembrance or commemoration. Today the word puja in Malay has only one reference, worship. And through the practice and construction and development of the Malay language towards that kind of linear meaning, entire traditions can be effaced, wiped out, victimized, just in your head alone. Yeah? Um, Pusaka's journey really has, uh, you know, um, there has been, no, it's okay. Um, 21 years, uh, and now that we are getting down really to doing a lot of writing, uh, I have a big quarrel with one of my great heroes who has inspired so much of this work. He's, an, he's a scholar, a very fine scholar. Uh, his name is Professor Anis. Professor Anis is a man I love very much, very close to my family. You know. But I have a great quarrel with the way he describes Pusaka. Uh, he calls us impresarios. Impresarios. Um, and that is a, a, a term I greatly reject. Uh, I think a lot of our work, very vitally, has been based on interrogation. Uh, we are documenters, we are interrogators. We bring performances to Kuala Lumpur. And these are truncated performances. So you don't see five-hour performances of Wayang here. Maybe we should do it one day, do a five-hour mind putri and see how far the Kuala Lumpur audience can tahan. Okay? <laughs> right? um, but performances in Kuala Lumpur are just that. They're performative. Uh, they don't lose any of the essence, I don't think. But they are performative. They're very truncated. And they're meant to be provocative. Right? They're meant to, audiences are meant to enter this realm and attempt to try and understand what is actually going on. A couple of weeks ago, we had a festival and we brought the Kudakapang. And the Kudakapang, uh, and this is something I want to say about Malaysia uh, in conclusion. Uh, I, I had a speech, uh, I had a talk today with uh, Professor Jomo and a few others speaking to young uh, people, uh, it's called the World Economic, Professor Jomo was there, yeah. World Economic Forum. Young people, about 20 to 30. Uh, very smart, uh, very intelligent, uh, very inquiring. No foundational knowledge. Absolutely no foundational knowledge about their country and about their region. But wonderful otherwise, huh? really wonderful animated. No foundational knowledge. Malaysia, Malaya, Malaysia as a cultural landscape is very unique, even in Southeast Asia. Yeah? And one of the great things I have been challenging myself with is what term we use to describe this. We borrow Western terms, plurality, multiculturalism, Multiculturalism is a Blairite term, it's so new. And we don't have a term of our own. For 20 years, I think, I've been battling with this term. I need to give it a milder illusion. The term is bastard. We are a bastard culture. Uh, I use that word as well, my mother gets a bit upset, but you know, when I was growing up, I'm a mixed child. 
That was the word that was thrown at me all the time by cultural Puritans, right? Bastard, paria, you know? And like James Baldwin, you own the term. You grow up to own the term that, you know, you have been spat at with. But also in terms of reference, that's what it is. And Malaysia in particular, more so than the rest of Southeast Asia. As we expanded our work, you know, after concentrating a lot in Kelantan, uh, we come across traditions like the Teochew puppet uh, lingo, absolutely wonderful. Uh, I just fell in love with her the first time I saw her because I expected her to be old, but she was very young and sexy, you know, and it's like, I just have such a crush on her till today. Uh, and she teases me quite well too. That day she sent me a birthday message that said, Sayang, happy birthday, Sayang. And I was like, all thrilled. But, um, you know, it's, uh, Teochew puppetry is not even performed in Teochew speaking regions in most of China. It's performed here. We work with the Urumi Melam drummer traditions, drumming traditions. Now, the Urumi Melam is amazing because it is a Dalit, working class, low caste tradition. Hmm? And uh, Indians are interesting in this country because the Indian predicament has so much to do with their quarrel with their history and their background. I keep reminding people that Indian history has a lot to say because when this country gained independence, 40% of this country's wealth was built on Indian semi-indentured indentured slavery, semi-slave states. Yeah? But the one thing that the Indian wants to do as soon as he can is forget where he comes from. So I have no quarrel with playing the sitar or playing the veena or doing the Bharatanatyam and whatever not. My brother's great Bharatanatyam. But that's not the story of Malaysian Indians. This is the story of Malaysian Indians, of Malaysian Indians playing these traditions, those drums, scare away the devil. Because those are the drums that are used when you enter an estate and you clear the land. The first thing that is done by Indians who clear the land and reap uh, the rubber trees and the, and, and the rubber latex uh, that gave so much wealth to British companies, not even this country, but British companies, is that you have to scare off the devils. And so you clear the thicket and you place a trident and then you open up that, that, that territory with these drums and pray to Kali and Muniswaran. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, Indians don't remember that. Uh, but the Urumi Melum has started to make a comeback with this great search for Indian identity, uh, Indian historical identity, proud Indian historical identity. And now the Urumi Melum uh, is uh, so received, it's now, you know, our, our groups, they have their music stolen by big Tamil movie productions. And Pusaka has to write letters, you know, demanding them <laughs> to acknowledge copyright. But these are our boys. In India, not that it's not performed, but it has no presence because it is that kind of tradition. Yeah, today, in, uh, today if you refer to the Urumi Melum, you're talking about Malaysian Indian boys carrying this, these uh, traditions. The Kudakapang is also very interesting. Kudakapang, known as uh, Jatilan or uh, what's Kudalumping in, in Indonesia. Um, in Indonesia today, the Kuda Lumping is like a big Kung Fu flick. It's performed in that kind of way. Sensational, uh, you know, strange trance states that I don't know whether are real because they seem to be so geared towards uh, Hong Kong type martial arts films. Uh, but over here, uh, the Kuda Kapang traditions we work with have a memory of being Javanese because it's that urgent and that imperative and that important to have the sense of of, of uh, genealogy and uh, um, uh, remembrance. Uh, so uh, our problem, of course, is ourselves. And I used this analogy when I spoke to the World Ec Youth Economic Forum today. I used a reference to the Irish Republican Army. The Irish Republican Army in those days, the IRA, when they caught a traitor, 
um, they didn't kill the traitor. You know what they did? They shot him in the knee. And they shot him in the knee in a particular kind of place. So that it provided the, the victim, uh, it gave him a certain kind of hobble. So you didn't just walk with a hobble, you walked with a certain kind of hobble, which revealed you to all your community as being an informant or a traitor. Uh, this is Malaysia's habit. This is what Malaysia does to itself. It gives itself a very strange hobble by forcing itself not to remember, uh, by allowing very Puritan forces to cleanse. Uh, and uh, you know what is very interesting at this cultural moment in Pusaka is we talk a lot about culture wars. Our wounds, our problems are not political. Politics is the symptom. But history and memory is our wound. And so we acknowledge that at some level. We talk about culture wars, we talk about the subliminal. But we don't have the language and the intellectual st structures to consistently carry that argument through. Um, and that's essentially, I think, what so many of the traditions we work with are about. That's a beautiful explanation. Uh, I need to remember it in full. For the mind putri, this was explained to me by a great Tok putri that I knew uh, in Klantan in the 1990s, whose name was Pak Yusuf. And uh, he lived uh, in a territory, in a place, uh, and you can see the kind of vulgarization that goes on. Um, in Kota Baru, the coastal town is known as, in its acronym as PCB, today known as Pantai Cahaya Bulan, right? Uh, the shore of the full moon. Um, that was the name given to it in the year 2000. Before that, we knew PCB as Pantai Cinta Brahi the place of amorous, passionate love. And the top putri there, you know, once explained uh, what mind putri was. Mind putri, if you translate it, is the play of the princess. And he said, Nama yang itu tidak dikenali. Yang, yang, nama yang itu, nama yang itu tidak kita kenali. Mujur, harus kita kenali dan diberi namanya. That whose name we do not know, so we must seek, find, and bequeath it its name. Very Adamic uh, in its approach. Uh, and with that, the poetry and the lyricism and that comes from essentially these uh, rural traditions. Uh, in closing, I, I don't know whether uh, I, I have a lot of pain with Pusaka's work. Uh, I think uh, we've done a lot of what we thought we'd never achieve 30 years ago. Uh, 30 years ago when I went to Klantan, I worked with five people who had no students. Uh, today, Pusaka works with 28 different groups all across Malaysia. In Klantan, we have so many students, we have to chase young people away. Uh, they perform beautifully. They're very competent performers but they are performers. They are not people of ritual and spirit. Uh, I am very fortunate, you know, I was born in 1969. Uh, 1969, Malaysian children are like India's midnight children. We always see the last bit of things. Uh, and so one of, I think, one of, one of the great things that I'm and reassured by is that none of these traditions are dying. They're more animated and alive than ever. And that we have, we have also battled and we've also fought off, fended off um, you know, censorship and, and proscription. But we've done it in very subversive and radical ways. And I think that's one thing we should also write about. Is, that's why I also do not believe that this country is Taliban. If this country was Taliban, I'd be dead 25 years ago. Right? But there are all these spaces in which we can negotiate all the time. Those spaces are shrinking, but they can still be negotiated. Mm -hmm. But really, my pain of Pusaka is, and that's maybe my being romantic and a sentimentalist, uh, is that the old ways of learning, 
the old ways of learning, which are very, very much rooted in oral cultures, are dissipating and cannot be learned again in that way. And so the performance cannot be done again in that way. So today, while all the ilmu loa, external knowledge, is really very competent, beautiful, and beautifully done, it is not supported by the inner knowledge. Uh, and the last uh, person I'm working with of that generation is Matsuti, who is 83. And once she passes, there may be one or two others who have this kind of knowledge, but it doesn't. But it's a whole societal and generational shift that can never come back. Um, that's my personal pain. It's not the pain of the organization, uh, but the pain of a midnight's child who just happened to get all his first experiences from that last generation uh, of performers uh, who were taught, who imbibed, and who believed in ritual and tradition in that kind of way. Thank you for listening. I can take questions, I think. Any questions or comments or yeah? Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, thank you for for very inspiring um, lecture. Um, I find it really interesting because I've always struggled with. Um, or I've seen memory as a different thing. For me, memory was always remembering the things that has caused had caused harm by their own culture. I mean, it's also because I'm of a European. Um, country which has caused un harmful food to, to millions of people. Um, but memory was always something that you struggle with and that you, you use to, 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 to remember the harmful things and never as the beauty um, of a culture. And do you see the struggle as memory also becoming of something maybe nationalist or, or too strong? Do you see the struggle? Because, because memory was always for me to, to, to get rid of harm or to remember harm, but because it has always created um, too much identity, has always created harm in the past. Um, so memory was never something beautiful to, to be, as you described it today, but always is something to, to remember. Harm. Yeah, no, I think it's neutral. Uh, I don't actually think that memory is necessarily beautiful, it's just what you have. And it's, it's the proximity. I think memory is more intimate. It's when history becomes more, more intimate. Not always beautiful, can be very painful, can be quite destructive also. But the important point is to remember, not to learn. Uh, you know, and, and I think this is what these traditions encapsulate. Remembrance as compared to something that is, that is educative. You know, it's something that is a lot more intimate. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, would you mind talking a little bit about the Mayan poetry and that feeling? And what, like, is it performance or ritual? Or I, I'm just, I'm just having trouble grasping what it was. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, the, the dividing line between performance and um, ritual is, uh, I think, you know, this, there, there are great writers who have written on this. Um, whether ritual is performance or performance is ritual. Uh, and very often, when we do ritual, we perform, whether it's in a Catholic church or you know, uh, evangelical traditions are... Evangelical traditions, Puritan uh, traditions are very interesting because they stand against the performance of anything, you see. Right? They stand against the performance. Uh, so Catholic rites and things like that, not on. But um, uh, it is uh, healing uh, ritual that is performed, uh, and it has elements of incantation, elements of song, in elements of dance. And the point is basically to uh, get uh, the patient uh, to arrive at a point of uh, emotional strength where they can actually get up and dance. <laughs> the point is to get up and dance. And once you get up and dance, basically, essentially, you know, it's. It, it, it revives 
uh, your, your inner self. Um, it's not performed if you break a leg. Uh, it's not performed if you have cancer. It's performed for psychological states. And of course, you know, one of the things I, I discovered that the birth of modern psychology, psychotherapy, is so much rooted in traditions like, like, like this. Uh, the notion of the subconscious, the notion of the aid, you know, all performed in things like the mind putri, African traditions, in, from voodoo. Um, so that's essentially what it is. And very often it's done also, uh, a top putri or a bomo is brought in uh, to perform the ritual aspects of other performative traditions, like the Mak Yong, and again, like the Wayang Kulit, Bajamu. Uh, so it's very focused, uh, essentially, on, uh, on the healing of, of um, a particular individual who's suffering from a certain kind of depressive ailment. Uh, and of course, it has a very deep resonance in the sense that if anybody in your community is depressed, it normally has the power to make everybody else depressed. So communities come together, basically, to uplift uh, this individual. That's just a very crude, very, very uh, general uh, description of it. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of when you talk about this oral learning and this idea of ritual, if you see any space within education for that to become something that is learned by this generation, or whether by inherently being put into education, and when I say education, I kind of mean schools and things like that, like a kind of very national idea of education, whether that automatically then will fall into this kind of um, political censorship kind of role again? I, I appreciate the question very much. It comes from a very good place. I don't know if I'm the person to respond to that uh, because I don't believe in systems. Uh, I don't believe schools can do very much but create sheep. <laughs> um, and and um, one of the great challenging things that I'm trying to write about is how actually rebellious these ritual traditions are. Yeah. Uh, um, very, very provocative, especially in terms of the kinds of orders we understand to operate. Uh, if you ask me, can these things be introduced in the schools? I don't think so, uh, because the, the intellectual approaches are very, very different. Um, what I always goad people to do is to go on journeys of discovery. Uh, you know, it, people must allow themselves to get a bit mad. Um, and I, I don't think systems allow, and I don't think these things can actually operate uh, within things like schools. Um, but intellectually, of course, you, are, you will be able to, you, you can engage, you can talk about these things. Um, I'm one of Posaka's great, I mean, we're a little late, we are a little late in this. But um, because we had so much work in terms of structure, and. You know, in, in a few lectures from now, I'd like to talk about the challenges of actually working uh, in culture in terms of structures. It takes so much time. It's, it's, it's so um, depressing sometimes. <laughs> um, viability, foundations, you know, because it is just so mad. When we first started, and Pauline and I kind of laugh about this, and we'd go sometimes to try and get corporate sponsorship. And then they would ask us, what is Mind Putri? <laughs> and we'd describe it. And you'd have someone from American Express who just had this look on their face. You, know? you can talk about it in terms of national culture, our people, collective culture, and everything, but they just kind of have this look on their face. And so Puzaka was very poor for many, 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 many years. Um, before we decided to link these things to other things. So a lot of our funding actually doesn't come directly for this work, but it comes for other work and then it spills, it spills over for this. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't think I have an answer to that question. I'm very interested in the future of ritual everywhere uh, because ritual has come to focus now on very elementary things 
like how you pray and how many times you do it, not you know what the prayer is about. Yeah, uh, and that's of course forms of social control uh, that have of course become accentuated and a lot easy to be manipulated through the machine age. Anyone else? Oh, banyak ni soalan. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you very much um, for your presentation, um, which um, is, I think, difficult to, to term. It is, is it a lecture what you gave to us, or uh, you call it a talk? Um, uh, for me, it was so that you... It's a meandering. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, you, you evoked a, a lot of associations. Uh, of course, many information, uh, much information, but also many, many associations. And if I uh, try to work out what, uh, what I take out of it is um, you described, uh, one string is you described um, the consequences of modernization, globalization and modernization. And that's, uh, I think, what, what also um, um, has caused this grief of you uh, watching um, uh, rituals um, fade away and, and becoming a sort of folklore when uh, presented um, uh, to others, uh, maybe to tourists or maybe to travelers, uh, or also when they are exported from um, uh, a federal state like Kelantan and to Kuala Lumpur. Um, I think that is, uh, that is a fate which is shared by um, many um, cultures in the world. We, we have seen it uh, also in other parts of the world. It is um, that living conditions of societies change, of also of small societies, and then you cannot uh, preserve the um, essential existential um, sense uh, of uh, a ritual and, and uh, the, yeah, the sense fades, fades away. The other question is um, about uh, Malaysia being exposed to so many, um, many different um, influences, um, Indian influence um, uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the rich uh, religious uh, influences of India, uh, then Islam, uh, then uh, Western influences. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if if I understood it correctly, but emotionally I, I tend to side with your mother uh, that I didn't like so much the term bastard, um, that, that, that uh, a bastard came out of it because it has such a negative uh, uh, connotation. Um, I, I don't know, I think that it's also for, for us, for foreigners, it's the most difficult thing uh, to understand what, what Malaysia is because it was exposed to uh, so many influences and uh, other cultures uh, besides the Malay were allowed to preserve their, their traditions. traditions, And uh, so, so it is difficult to say, um, is there a coherent Malaysian culture which we find here? Um, uh, it is somewhat fluid and there are several um, um, cultures in parallel which, uh, which we find here um, without uh, a center. That's at least uh, my, my impression. Um, I, I stop here, but I would like you to comment on that. Yeah, no, I think uh, it, that's a very, very challenging question. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, this is, was this a lecture? Was this a talk? It's quite a sharing, I think. And, and the point is, of this is to present the meanderings uh, uh, and the complexities and the bastardy, actually. Um, I, I arrived at this, this particular term because, you know, the, the great poet Derek Walcott, talking about the Caribbean, uh, keeps referring to it as a mongrel culture. Mongrel. Uh, and um, I, I like to think that we can remove ourselves from the historical weight that's associated with certain words. <laughs> Uh, I think that's very important to challenge how language can really be reinterpreted and appropriated within its own context uh, so that it doesn't come with this kind of burden. And uh, as I said, I refer to James Baldwin, the great American, uh, black American writer who, who, uh, who you know, wrote about the Negro, you know, a beautiful essay 
about the Negro and the need for the Negro to appropriate the term that has been used to spit on him. Um, so, um, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm trying to look for something a little more scholarly than bastard, but essentially that's what I'm referring to. That's what I'm referring to. As for the cohesion of Malaysia, you know, my attachment to this work began because I'm interested, still interested, will always be interested in the notion of the primordial and the primal. What is there before we present ourselves the way we are? What is there? What essentially is there? And one of Pusaka's great ambitions, really, and we are now going to start to be able to move towards it, because I think it's a, it's a, it's a field very, very neglected, uh, is what ritual is, not just here, but in Katakali, in Teum, in you know, all these other uh, performative traditions all around the world, um, that are suffering two kinds of challenges. One is complete, abeyance and you know it has no longer has a place the second great threat is institutionalization you institutionalize these cultures i'm very interested in voodoo and voodoo is not just about you know putting hex on people it's it's forms of of, of real serious uh, therapy um uh one of the great books i had and if you ask me is your talk a lecture um, there's a wonderful book that was written by a French uh, ethnomusicologist, anthropologist, by the name of Gilbert Roger. Uh, it's, the book is called Music and Trance. I really en encourage everybody to read it. Because, and his exploration, or his academic, or his scholarly objective, was to look at what the association between music and trance states is. And in 365 beautifully written pages, he had no answer. All he could do was describe. Uh, and so you go on this wonderful journey from you know, drum trance dancers in Benin to voodoo in Haiti and you know, uh, Katakali trances in Kerala. Um, and what you do, are make those associations. Uh, so for me, I, I don't think I want a coherent culture. We are not a nation. I don't believe in a Malaysian culture. There's no such thing. Just as I don't believe in a Malaysian language, that's why I refuse to say Bahasa Malaysia. It's nonsense. It's Bahasa Melayu, the Malay language. <laughs> and, and I don't think we need to make those, accommodate those niceties and pretend our problems don't exist. What you need to do with Bahasa Melayu is to get it so under your skin and speak it so well and write it so well and translate it so well uh, that you put Bahasa Melayu fascists to one side, you see, they don't dare, dare say anything to you. Uh, you have to know Islam that way. You have to know Malay culture that way, so that Pusaka is never touched, intellectually at least. Because I've always told my Pusaka team, if we are arrested, I will go. I will go to the, you know, and you all just stay in the community. If we are scandalized, you know, drop a ton of intellectual bricks on those people and they'll keep quiet. And that's exactly what has happened. Uh, so we normally say things. I think in 2004, there was a case when somebody wanted to report me to the police for commenting on Islam. But I'm an Islamic scholar. My first degree is in Islam, so I can talk about it. I'm not ulama, but I'm an Islamic scholar. But you need to cover all that ground, and it's a lot of work. But uh, I don't think we need a central Malaysian culture, a cohesive Malaysian culture. We are not. It would be a lie. Uh, and I think um, uh, what is important about things like ritual uh, and, and the aspect of this, of, of primal energies uh, and theater, and you know, you look at the world of politics today, it's full of primal energies, full, full of it. Um, and people try to, uh, uh, um, you know, crowd, couch it with, with uh, geopolitical terms. It doesn't work, it's, it's, it's still primordial. <laughs> it's still primordial. And, uh, very interesting discussion today at that conference was how we no longer have the language to sustain that kind of probing and interrogative uh, thing about things like you know violence or, or, or things like brutality or things like uh, conquest 
We don't because we have uh, you know, not considered it functional and utilitarian for 50, 60 years. Yeah. It's not there in our education systems and in our schools. Who talks about these things? But you know, th these things then become very important. I'm not saying, I'm not a savior, yeah? I'm not on a, on a crusade to save anything. Um, I have a commitment to my community and I have a commitment to my country. Uh, whether my country wants to know these things still exist or not, they, I know I'm just going to show it in their faces. <laughs> <laughs> right and and so I have none of those, uh, you know, national culture things. I I find culture just gets very very dead when you talk about it in 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 those terms. Uh, so for me, let the bastardy reign, you know. And at all crisis points, we will return to it. At crisis points, we will return. So this idea that things just pass, and you know, and Europe is very interesting for me, in the way that people are returning to the folk song. You know, in, in the United States, I just told Pauline that you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I really want to go to the American South, Alabama, Tennessee. I traveled there many, many years ago. But the number of young people that have returned to things like bluegrass, uh, you know, and bridging bluegrass and blues, um, uh, you know, experiencing the Delta blues with bluegrass, is very, very interesting. But it's a crisis point in um, American culture too. Uh, and I think when we arrive at those culture points, we will fall back on those things. One last question, and then I'm very tired. <laughs> oh, two more questions. Okay, two more questions, and then I'm very tired. And uh, the first question is that how with the political scenes uh, in terms of our landscape at the moment, how do we uh, keep this, uh, the cultures and especially on all uh, what you have shared? Because I think with things that are happening now in terms of uh, politically, so I think it can be quite an uphill task to do that. That's the first question. The second question would be like, when will you be bringing Tina Riven or the <laughs> Indian dramas uh, back again? Thank you. I have a very uh, favorable, positive answer for you. Uh, Tina Riwan, the great, uh, the great uh, uh, Sahara blues group, uh, admired by everyone from Carlos Santana to John Mayer, um, and was last performed in Kuala Lumpur in 2017. Pusaka brought them here. They, be, they will be returning for a concert here on December 15th. So that's Tina Riwan for you. Um, politics, um, yeah, well, uh, politics, you, you have to be able to improvise. You know, you know how to fight politics is you need to know your country so well. Uh, you need to know the contradictions and locate yourself in those contradictions uh, so that you can fight off the, 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 the politics. It's getting harder because as I always said when we first started, the point of uh, Puritan bans and proscriptions is not this generation. It's three generations later. And uh, while I'm all for demonstrations, as I said, I love them. Uh, you know, as I was caught in the traffic jam, I realized that we have a lot, very lot of young people with a lot of adrenaline on motorbikes. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, the politics is, is like that, you know, we, we, we just have to, but knowledge, you have to locate yourself in knowledge and you have to know your country. And um, uh, I believe in guerrilla warfare. I think that's always the best way to subvert situations uh, and uh, guerrilla people have to be very very you know like that like jazz singers like you just need to be able to you know um, dance on the keys <laughs> one more question and then are you banyak new okay two more questions last huh? sorry oh. okay sorry hi hi <clears throat> no, first like thank you for the talk it was amazing um, you talked about like performative and hello hi um, you talk about performative and oral traditions throughout and their preservation and I feel like what's unique about those forms of storytelling is that they're living they kind of change and shift with uh, each performance, uh, kind of like what you brought up, um, the pre and post 
performance of like the Wayan Kulit where all the performers kind of debate the narrative. Um, I was wondering if you could speak on if, if at all, whether there's like a line or an area where that shift and transformation of the narrative uh, starts to get divorced from the per preservation of the story. Was I, was I clear on that? Uh, no, uh, okay, that's, um, uh, to us, that's a very important impulse. Any storyteller who's telling you the same story in the same way is a useless artist. Uh, very different from Indonesia. This is so, you know, people like to, again, because of our lack of knowledge, we are constantly imposing other experiences onto ourselves. Ours is not a classical tradition, eh? you know, not a classical, whereby faithfulness to the tradition is what tradition is all about. Ours is a very rebellious tradition, as I told you, you know, the way Ramayana has been taken to, you know, every part of the jungle and back <laughs> in terms of its story. Uh, so the point is not to preserve the story. The point is to know the foundational story and then use your improvisational skills to lift it off. Uh, and the merit of an artist, of how good an artist is, is how well you do that. Anybody who stays through the story is regarded as really an amateur and not worth uh, going in and visiting. Um, critical language, the language of criticism within the ritual setting is very interesting. I've never been able to get a proper answer from Dalang Dola, for example, on why a Dalang is good or no good. If he doesn't like a Dalang, he will make a strange face. That's it. Is he a good Dalang? Okay, that's it. That's the answer. He'll never say why. And so you don't know what informs that decision. Maybe rivalry? I don't know. Uh, but from the way he talks about storytelling, uh, the aspect of the improvisational is very, very important. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, Mew. Hi. Um, not really a question, but a lot of thoughts going through my mind. And um, I like the word paria. I remember when my mom look for a dog, she has to make sure it's a paria dog, pure breed, um, because it's functional, it's useful. That kind of dog works. It's not a pet. Um, and in Malaysia, I think Roja is nice. Roja has gone through thousands of years of polishing and becoming what it is today. So I feel like that experience, when I felt, uh, when I studied anthropology, I realized that dancers are just no big deal. Artists are just no big deal. They're just a product. Mm. And that's very important. Uh, that brings an artist down from the cloud and rooted. So if Malaysian can recognize that we are beautiful in that way, that we are special in that way, and we are useful to the world in that way, which means in this country, many cultures, not just Malaysia, I'm sure other, other places as well, that different cultures can come together and coexist nicely as what you have shown today, how beautifully over the years, these dalang, these masters, just blend in and perform at present and not just presenting I'm an artist, but being part of a village, part of the people, then they are functional. So I see that two things today, that if we can stop trying to have great theatres and great orchestra and great ballet, and just recognise who we are and build from it and develop it and promote it because soft, cult, soft power is something that makes other country recognize mm. us. But soft power has to be deliberately, deliberately promoted out to others. In that, so these are just a few things that, that rel, 
realizing that and acknowledging it and embodying it, which is very dancers. Dancers do rituals every day. Every time we train our body, it's a ritual. And when you go on to stage to perform, it's a ritual with others and you have to feel the audience and you feel your co-performers. I think that is why art, performing arts is so critical, is so important. And uh, sometimes I, as a dancer, I feel that dance is higher than anything else, higher than language, for example, because dance would have existed before language because of that primal thing. So it's just something I would like to share as well. You know what Samuel Beckett said? Before thinking, dance. Or dance before thinking, or something like that. Um, okay, one last one, and then I'm going to quit. Brother. Okay, well. <laughs> um, two things. I was very interested when you said and called it a uh, rebelliousness or rebellious culture. Um, and then also the idea of her orality. Um, <clears throat> my question would be, and, and then I'd also like to know, because you seem to have said that there will be other lectures, right? And whether any aspect of this will be enlarged upon in your other lectures, which is one. Do you think that rebelliousness really has also a lot to do with the fact that Clanton at one point went up to as far as the Isthmus of Kra, and it is the gateway into Nusantara where intersections of culture, ethnicities, people, stories, and narratives, one. And two, do you think that that orality that you speak about before the arrival of the technology of writing, where they, it is, you know, you know what I mean, but whether it's Aborigines or Papua, New Guinea, where the live reality, and you talk about remembrance, right, and itself, it's, it's the whole body yeah. that, that is experiencing the live reality, and that becomes your memory. Your memory is not here and remembered by here. Now, between the two, do you think, ironically, it is because of reality that the culture has survived? And, which is like, this first time I heard, and I thought, my God, I never saw it that way. You know, what you said. So it is because of orality. Usually you think orality means it's going to die. It dies. Um, that may be now because the context has changed. But it's really fascinating that. Would you um, share that in other, uh, now? Or are you going to talk about that further? Yeah, no, I will talk about that further. But you're absolutely right. Uh, orality is the operation of the entire, all of the senses, you know? It is not written, uh, is, and then not visualized, because it's, it doesn't become completely cerebral. This is the problem we have with the younger generation, of course. That is impossible, uh, almost near impossible. Uh, but sensuality, which is always the foundational thing for rebelliousness, and Malay culture is very interesting. Huh? Its reason is always for order. Its love is always for the rebellious, yeah? always. Um, the Malays may have adopted Hang Tua as the way they live, but their heart is all with Hang Jebat. <laughs> and that is my great quarrel with the film, film Mat Kilau. Mat Kilau was an amazing Robin Hood, you know? And of course he prayed, but he was a bootlegger. He sold bootleg whiskey and he got upset that people were trying to interfere and take away the taxes for the bootleg whiskey. Same with Tok Jangkut, actually. Very pious Alim Ulama. But he sold black alcohol. <laughs> and these contradictions are, are where the power of the Malay rebel lies. And yet, in today's, we tend to kind of homogenize them and strip them of all these, all, all, all these eccentricities. Uh, you know, maybe we should do a lecture on the Malay rebel. I, I need to close already. No more questions, right? Okay. Oh. Hi, just, just one last question. Uh, I want to, since you talked a lot about oral traditions, um, I want to ask how do you think that has evolved today and how oral traditions still exist or maybe they don't? No, oral traditions are, are, are suffering because of literacy. And yet you cannot fault literacy, 
but I don't know how you can get that impulse of 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 or, or, orality. So it's it's it, we are in kind of transition, lah. You know, it's it's the kind of tr transitional phase, but a lot of our of our pedagogy when it comes to uh, arts and performance uh, no longer takes into account the the oral. I will just conclude. Uh, last thing is, um, I'm supposed to sell something, but I am selling selling something with a reason. Can we have the picture of the cover? Um, for Posaka's 21 years, we are compiling a book called uh, What is Remembered? Uh, and uh, we are doing pre-order sales. I think you can register out there and pre-order a book, which will help make the book come true. But uh, I just want to say something about orality and uh, the study of uh, ritual and tradition here. It's never been spoken from the mouths themselves. Uh, and this is very important to Posaka, that we are not mouthpieces of anybody. Uh, we are students and we are listeners and we gather these stories. Uh, if you go and look at any of the studies uh, of Malaysian traditional theatre and so on, it's all interpretation uh, and scholastic approach. Uh, this is the first book to actually collect voices from real masters of tradition, talking about everything from the traditions that they practice, from lineage, from memory, from understanding of song, music, to the politics uh, being put together for publication uh, next uh, February. So you can sign up if you want a copy outside. Uh, at the end, just to conclude, um, you know, worlds like this are an entire world. Um, I found very few people who had provided a path for me to step on with this kind of work. I was not interested in uh, scholars. They really bored me, really, really gave me brain bleeds. And most of the time, they were fantasizing about things that didn't really happen. Uh, I want to pay intellectual tribute to three people, uh, four people. Uh, and I hope that you, you would like to maybe just go and search them out. The first man is a man called A.K. Ramanujan. A.K. Ramanujan was a wonderful Indian poet and uh, a scholar of folklore. Uh, who wrote a seminal essay called 300 Ramayanas, looking at you know, the vernacular Ramayanas beyond the hegemonic ones of Valmiki and Kamban. So a lot of my idea of meandering sir, comes from that. The other person is Derek Walcott, the, the Nobel Prize winner and the Caribbean poet, who was also a playwright uh, and who, who uh, waded through to find his own voice. And of course, he wrote Omeros, which is the great Caribbean version of the Odyssey. <laughs> and he wrote it in Patwa. Uh, absolute uh, incredible achievement. The third person is Gonawan Muhammad, who is a dear friend of mine, an Indonesian writer and, and, and uh, thinker and poet. Uh, and uh, these were reference points. And the fourth one, which really encapsulates, I think, everything that we have talked on, uh, talked about, is someone you would know and someone who I've just been in touch with last week inviting him to come to Malaysia, but he's 83, just published his, um, just published his uh, memoirs, but he sends uh, us all a wish. Good luck to Malaysia, a country I would love to visit one day. Uh, but this man is, is very central to the way I think about this work. His name is Werner Herzog, uh, and I think he encapsulates everything I have just about done in Pusaka. It is the conquest of the useless. Thank you very much. Books are there. <laughs>